Hi, and welcome to In Absentia's virtual production of The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde. My name is Matt Kowalik, and I am a founding member and the artistic director of In Absentia. Um, the original concept uh, of In Absentia was to get some people together and uh, do something to do with theater uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and now here we are. It's very cool. Um, when the lockdowns and, and the closures uh, first started, um, I know the first thing I thought about was, oh, oh, I'm going to miss all the things that I love uh, so dearly. Um, but uh, In Absentia has been something of a, something of a lifesaver in the fact that um, it's helped so many of us, I think, focus on the things that we can still do. Um, can we have a traditional curtain? No. Uh, can we study a script or build a character or discuss the theory of blocking or other theater fundamentals? Yes. Um, can we do this as a community and return to a traditional knowledge sharing model uh, where we help each other learn and grow? Absolutely, yes. Um, can we potentially make that somehow through new technology um, coast to coast, maybe. Um, can we do it in a creative and fun way? Absolutely. Um, as I've watched what's happened uh, with In Absentia and its members over the last few weeks, I've come to fully believe uh, that when creative minds come together uh, as a community, um, we can go from a simple concept to nearly 100 members and 35 performers um, all willing to try something new, uh, even if it might not work. Um, we are all learning this together, as communities do. Um, I got to stop and thank the directors. They were awesome. So Bill Walker, uh, Jessica Otram, Brenda Worsna, Bob Bailey, Heather Jopling, and Kim Brower were uh, amazing and uh, pathmakers for us all. Um, their openness and inclusiveness and total commitment uh, to what we were trying to do uh, has been really cool. Um, the creativity they brought to the project, uh, as well as uh, their willingness to share and bring new ideas back to the group so we could adopt them and adapt them and then um, try something new and bring our experiences back to the group um, was uh, amazing. And uh, I thank them so much for, uh, for their time and their um, uh, willingness to share. Um, so what is next for an absentia? Uh, the big question. Uh, I am incredibly excited uh, to announce that next week we will begin taking submissions for the very first In Absentia Fringe of Northumberland Festival. Uh, anyone interested in directing a show can submit a 3 to 15 minute script. Um, and it is, you know, unless we get a billion of them, uh, they will be accepted. Uh, we will help you cast your show and then we will uh, host or facilitate the festival over a week. Um, part of that will include a Q&A uh, with the directors after we watch uh, the video they submit. Um, uh, this process is open to anyone anywhere, so share it with your friends and let them know it's coming if they want to participate, and uh, I hope you want to participate. So more to come on that next week. Um, that's not what we're here for. We are here for the importance of being earnest. Um, we had such fun doing this, uh, and I truly hope that you like it. Um, before we roll, uh, a last second thank you must go out to Victor uh, Svenningsen. He's been our technical guru and um, our, a great confidant to myself uh, and uh, a mentor to me. Uh, so thank you, Victor, for your dedication uh, and openness and patience with me. Um, I'd also like to thank Bob Bailey, uh, who has taken uh, uh, a real positive interest in this project. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I think he sees what so many of us see, which is uh, a way to continue to grow community even post COVID. Um, now, <laughs> what we're all here for, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I proudly present uh, the importance of being earnest.
was playing, Lane. Oh, I didn't think it's polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. But I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Oh, yes, sir. And speaking of life and the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches for Lady Bracknell? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Oh. Uh, hmm. uh, oh, uh, by the way, Lane, I see from your book on Thursday night that when Lord Shawman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Uh, yes, sir, eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. Oh, well, I, I attribute it to superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often found that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. Good heavens! Is marriage so demoralizing as all that? I, I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I have had very little experience of it myself up to the present. I have only been married once, and that was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. Uh, I don't know that I'm much interested in your family life, Lane. Oh, oh, no, sir. It's not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Very natural, I am sure. Uh, that will do, Lane. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem, as a class, to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. A Mr. Ernest Worthing. How are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, Algy. I believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? Oh, in the country. But what on earth do you do there? When one is in the country, one amuses other people. When one is in town, one amuses oneself. Amusing other people is excessively boring. And who are these people you amuse? Oh, neighbors, neighbors. Got nice neighbors in your part of Shropshire. Perfectly horrid. I never <laughs> speak to one of them. <laughs> How immensely you must amuse them. <laughs> By the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Hey, Shropshire, yes, of course. Hello. Why all these teacups? Why all these cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who's coming to tea? Oh, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well, but I am afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. Well, may I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolyn. Oh. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you had come up for pleasure. I call that business. <laughs> How utterly unromantic you are. I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. It is very romantic to be in love, but there is nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why, one may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. Then the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. 
if ever I get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. <laughs> I have no doubt about that, dear Algy. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. Oh, there's no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. <laughs> Please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. Well, you've been eating them the whole time. Well, that is quite a different matter. She is my aunt. I have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. Mm. And very good bread and butter it is too. Well, my dear fellow, you need not eat as if you were going to eat at all. You behave as if you were married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Well, why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it right. That is nonsense. It isn't. It is a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin, and before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? Well, hmm. what on earth do you mean? What do you mean, Algy, by Cecily? I don't know anyone by the name of Cecily. Mm-hmm. Bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Do you mean to say that you've had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you had let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. Well, there's no good offering a large reward now that the thing is found. <laughs> It's rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. However, it makes no matter, for now that I look at the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't yours after all. Well, of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times, and you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it's absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I am quite aware of the fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette case is, is a present from someone of the name of Cecily. And you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Uh, well, uh, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes, a charming old lady. She is too. Lives at Tunbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, Algy. But why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives at Tunbridge Wells? From Little Cecily, with her fondest love. God, my dear fellow, what on earth in there is that? Uh, some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. That is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt. That is absurd. If for heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. Yes, but why does your aunt call you her uncle? From little Cecily, with her fondest love, to her dear uncle Jack. There is no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt, but why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It is Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. You've always told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name is Ernest. You are the most earnest looking person I ever saw in my life. It is perfectly absurd you're saying that your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here. Here's one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing before the Albany. There. 
I'll keep this as proof that your name is Ernest, if you ever attempt to deny it to me, or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else. Well, my name is Ernest in town, and Jack in the country, and the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but uh, that does not account for the fact that your small Aunt Cecily, who lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle. Come, old boy, you had much better have the thing out at once. Uh, my dear Algy, you talk exactly if you were a dentist. It is a very vulgar thing to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. Well, that is exactly what dentists always do. Now, go on. Tell me the whole thing. I may mention that I've always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret Bunburyist, and I'm quite sure of it now. Bunburyist? What on earth do you mean by a Bunburyist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to inform me why you are Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. <clears throat> now, produce your explanation. Yeah. Make it improbable. My dear fellow, there is nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me, in his will, guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle, from motives of respect that you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country of, under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Well, where, where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not going to be invited. I may tell you straight, candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. Well, I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have bunburied all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now, go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? Oh, my dear Algy, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. They're hardly serious enough. And when one is placed in the position of a guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness. In order to get up to town, I have always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the elderly and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That, my dear Algy, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either. In modern literature, a complete impossibility. Well, that wouldn't be a bad job thing. <laughs> well, literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should leave that to the people who haven't been at university. They do it so well in the daily papers. Now, what you really are is a Bunburyist. I was quite right in saying you're a Bunburyist. You are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. But what else do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest in order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury, in order that I may be able to go down to the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis's tonight, for I've been really engaged down to Augusta for more than a week. But I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You are absurdly careless about sending out invitations. It is very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. You'd much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. To begin with, I dine there on Monday. And once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. In the second place, whenever I do dine there, I'm always treated as a member of the family and sent down with either no woman at all or two. In the third place, I know perfectly well whom she will place me next to tonight. She will place me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. That's not very pleasant. Indeed, it's not even decent. That sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It is simply washing one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I would naturally want to talk to you about Bunburying. I want to tell you the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Sir Cecily is a little too much interested in him. It is rather a bore. 
So I'm going to get rid of Ernest, and I strongly advise you to do the same with Mr. With your invalid friend who has the absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. And if you ever get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you will be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. Oh, that is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she is the only girl I ever saw in my life that I would marry, I certainly won't want to know Bunbury. <laughs> then your wife will. You don't seem to realise that in married life, three is company and two is none. That, my dear young friend, is a theory that corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. <laughs> yes, and that the happy English home has proved in half the time. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. My dear fellow, it isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such a lot of beastly competition about. Oh, that must be Aunt Augusta. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that Wagnerian manner. Now, if I get her out of the way for ten minutes, so that you can have an opportunity for proposing to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you tonight at Willis's? I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate people who are not serious about meals. It's so shallow of them. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you're behaving well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Oh, dear me, you are smart. I'm always smart, am I not, Mr. Worthing? You're perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I am not that. It would leave no room for developments, and I intend to develop in uh, many directions. I'm sorry for a little late, Algernon, but I was obligated to call on dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since her poor husband's death. I'd never seen such a woman so altered. She looked quite 20 years younger. And now I'll have a cup of that tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches that you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Won't you come and sit here, Gwendolyn? No, no thanks, Mama. I'm uh, quite comfortable where I am, thank you. Good heavens! Lane! Why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I, I ordered them specially. Uh, there were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. Uh, it went down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers, sandwiches, not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who seems to be to be living entirely for pleasure now. Oh, I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its color. From what cause, I of course cannot say. Thank you. I've quite, I have quite the treat for you tonight, Algernon. I'm going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. She's such a nice woman and so attentive to her husband. It's delightful to watch them. I am afraid, Aunt Augusta, I have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight after all. I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your uncle will have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. Oh, it is a great bore. And I hardly say a terrible disappointment to me, but the fact is I have just had a telegram from my poor friend Bunbury again. Um, they seem to think I should be with him. Oh, it is very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I must say, Algernon, that I think it is high time that Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or to die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd, nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is primary duty of life. I'm always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice. 
as far as any improvement of his ailment goes. I should much be obliged to, if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season where everyone has practically said whatever they have to say, which in most cases was probably not very much. I'll speak to Bunbury and uh, Uncle Gusto, if you're still conscious. <laughs> but I think I can promise you he'll be all right by Saturday. Of course, the music uh, is a, a great difficulty. You see, when one plays good music, uh, people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I'll run over the program I've drawn out. If you'll uh, kindly come into the next room for a moment. Thank you, Algernon. It's very thoughtful of you. I'm sure that with the program will be delightful after a few expurgations. French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think that they're improper or either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language indeed. I believe so. Gwendolyn, will you accompany me? Certainly, Mama. Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. And that makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to, t to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room and I have often had to speak to her about. But, Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any girl I have ever met since I met you. Yes, I am quite well aware of that fact. And I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone by the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. But you don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest? But your name is Ernest. Yes, I know it is, but supposing it was something else. You mean to say you couldn't love me then? <sighs> that is a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life as we know them. Personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care about the name Ernest. I don't think the name suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. Well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say that I think there are lots of other much nicer names. I think Jack, for instance, a charming name. Jack? No, there is very little music in the name Jack, if any at all, indeed. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John, and I pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. There is no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing? Well, surely you know that I love you, and you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you were not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. 
Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it only fair to tell you, quite frankly, beforehand, that I am fully determined to accept you. Gwendolyn! Yes, Mr. Worthing? What have you got to say to me? You know what I have got to say to you. Y yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. How long have you been about it? I am afraid you've had very little experience in how to propose. My own one. I have never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. What wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They are quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me just like that, especially when other people are present. Mr. Worthing, rise, sir, from this semi-recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his help permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise. Pleasant or unpleasant, as the case may be, it is hardly a matter that she could be allowed to arrange for herself. And now I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Warden. While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn, the carriage! Yes, Mama! You can take a seat, Mr. Warden. Uh, uh, th thank you, uh, Lady Bracknell. I, I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that you are not on my list of eligible men, although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Uh, well, yes, I, I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married. I have always been of opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I'm pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Oh. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. <laughs> if it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. 
what between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either profit or pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. I have a, a country house with some land, of course, attached to it. About 1,500 acres, I believe. I, I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, uh, the, the poachers are the only people to make anything out of it. The country house? How many bedrooms? Well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh. She goes about very little. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What's the number in Belgrave Square? Uh, 149. The unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could be easily altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Well, I, I'm afraid I, I really have none. I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they got us Tories. They, <laughs> buy, they dine with us. And, and come in the evening, at any rate. Hmm. Now, on to minor matters. Are your parents living? Uh, I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Wadling, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce, or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I, I really don't know. Uh, the fact is, uh, Lady Bracknell, I, I said I lost my parents. It would be near the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was, well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time, Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. Where did this charitable gentleman who had a first class ticket for a seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I was in a handbag. A somewhat large, black leather handbag with, with handles on it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew find this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake of his own. In the cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton Line. The line is immaterial, Mr. Harvey. Oh, I confess, I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have told me. To be born, 
At any rate, bread in a handbag, whether it's had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life. That reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. <laughs> and I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion has probably indeed been used for that purpose before now, but it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. May I ask you then what you would advise me to do. I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Wadley, to try and acquire some relations and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is over. Well, I, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. It's in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What does it do, do with me? <laughs> you can hardly imagine that Lord Bracknell and I would dream of allowing our only daughter, a daughter brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a handbag? Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Good morning. Bum, bum, ba, bum, 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 ba, bum. Oh, for goodness sake, don't play that ghastly tune now, G. What an, how idiotic you are. Didn't it go off all right, old boy? You don't mean to say Gwendolyn refused you. I know it is a way she has. She is always refusing people. I think it is most ill-natured of her. Oh, Gwendolyn is right as a trivet. As far as she is concerned, we are engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. I never met such a gorgon. I really don't know what a gorgon is like, but I'm quite sure that Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she is a monster, without being a myth, which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Algy. I suppose I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, I love hearing my relations abused. <laughs> it is the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't the remotest knowledge of how to live, nor the smallest instinct about when to die. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. That is exactly what things were originally made for. Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. You don't think that there's any chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about 150 years, do you, Algy? <laughs> All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. <laughs> That's his. <laughs> Is that clever? It is perfectly phrased, and quite as true as any observation in civilized life should be. Well, I am sick to death of cleverness. Everybody is clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The thing is an absolute public nuisance. I wish to goodness we had a few fools left. We have. I should extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? The fools? <laughs> oh. Well, they talk about the clever people, of course. <laughs> what fools! <laughs> By the way, uh, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth of your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't quite the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl. What extraordinary ideas you have of how to talk to a woman. Well, the only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her. 
if she is pretty, and to someone else if she is plain. <laughs> oh, that is nonsense. <laughs> oh, but what about your brother? What of the profligate Ernest? Ah, uh, before the end of next week, I shall have rid of him. I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Uh, yes, but it's hereditary, my dear fellow. It's the sort of thing that runs in families. You had much better say uh, a severe chill. Oh, you're sure a severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of that kind? Of course it isn't. Hmm. Very well then. My poor brother Ernest, to carry it off suddenly in Paris by a severe chill, that gets rid of him. But, uh, I thought you said that, um, Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in your poor brother, Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a good deal? Oh, that is all right. Cecily is not a silly, romantic girl, I'm glad to say. She's got a capital appetite, goes long walks, and pays no attention at all to her lessons. <laughs> I would rather like to see Cecily. <laughs> I will take your very good care to make sure you never do. She is excessively pretty and she is only just 18. Um, have you told Gwendolyn yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? One does not blurt these things out to people. Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to become extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything you like, after a half an hour they have met, they will be calling each other sister. Oh, women only do that when they have called each other a lot of other things first. Now, my dear boy, if we want to get a good table at Willis's, we really must go and dress. Do you know it is nearly seven? Oh, it is always nearly seven. Well, I am hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. What shall we do after dinner? Uh, go to a theater? Oh, no, I loathe listening. Well, let us uh, go to the club. Oh, no, I hate talking. Well, we might uh, trot round to the Empire at uh, ten. Oh, no, I can't bear looking at things. It is so silly. Well, what shall we do? Nothing. It is awfully hard work doing nothing. However, I don't mind hard work where there is no definite object of any kind. <laughs> Miss Fairfax. Upon my word. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. Really, Gwendolyn. I don't think I can allow this at all. Algy. You always adopt a strictly moral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough for that. My own darling. Oh, Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I ever had on Mama, I lost at the age of three. Although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else, and marry often. Nothing that she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Dear Gwendolyn. The story of your romantic origin, as related to me by Mama, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the, the deeper fibers of my nature. Your Christian name has an, an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you, oh, exquisitely incomprehensible to me. <sighs> your time address at Albany I have. What is your address in the country? The Manor House, Walton, Herefordshire. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate, but of course will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. Oh, my own one. How long do you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algy, you may turn around now. Thanks, I've turned round already. You may also ring the bell. You will let me see you to your carriage, my own darling? Oh, certainly. I will see Miss Fairfax out, Lane. Yes, sir. A glass of sherry, Lane. Yes, sir. 
Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going bum burying. Yes, sir. I shall probably not be back till Monday. You can put up my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all my bunberry suits. Yes, sir. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, you're the perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. There is a sensible, intellectual girl, the only girl I ever cared for in my life. <laughs> for you, sir, I'm used at. Uh, I'm a little anxious about poor Bunbury, that's all. Uh, if you don't take care, your friend Bunbury will get you into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They're the only things that are never serious. Oh, uh, that's nonsense, Algy. You never talk anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does. <laughs> Cecily! Cecily! Surely such a utilitarian occupation as watering the flowers is rather Moulton's duty than yours, especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar lesson is on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays particular stress on your German when he is leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he's so serious that I think he cannot possibly quite do well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is especially to be commended in one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when the three of us are together. <laughs> Cecily, I'm surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I am sure you certainly would. You know, German and geology and things of that kind influence a man very much. I do not think that I could even produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, of irrevitably at weak and facilitating. <sighs> Indeed, I am not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I am not in favor of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that, I have, that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is... A responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Marty sends us. Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in my earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are! I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. The good ended happily, and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so, but it seems so very unfair. And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. I use that word in the sense of lost or mislaid. To your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But, but I see uh, Dr. Shazable coming up through the garden. 
Dr. Chasuble, this is indeed a pleasure. And how are we this morning, Miss Prism? You are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think she, it would do her so much good to have a short stroll in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. Oh, no, Miss Prism, I know that, but I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily. I hope, Cecily, uh, you are not inattentive. <laughs> I am afraid I am. Oh, that is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. <laughs> Yeah, I spoke metaphorically. Uh, my metaphor was drawn from bees. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I suppose, uh, is not returned from town yet. We do not expect him until Monday afternoon. Ah, uh, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sunday in London. He is not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment. Yes, uh, by all accounts, uh, that uh, unfortunate uh, young man, his brother seems to be here. Uh, but I must not disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. <laughs> A classic illusion <laughs> drawn nearly from the pagan authors. <laughs> I see you. Uh, I see you. Uh, I shall see you both at uh, Evensong, no doubt. I think, dear doctor, I will have a stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all, and a walk might do it good. Oh, with pleasure, Miss Prism. With pleasure. <laughs> we might go as far as the schools in there. That would be delightful. Cecily? You will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. Horrid political economy. Horrid geography. Horrid, horrid German. Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany W. <gasps> Uncle Jack's brother. Uh, did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. I suppose you'd better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Oh, yes, miss. I've never really met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I'm so afraid he will look just like everyone else. He does! You are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You are under some strange mistake. I am not little. In fact, I believe I'm more than usually tall for my age. But I am your cousin Cecily. You, I see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother, my cousin Ernest, my wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, I am not wicked at all, cousin Cecily. You mustn't think I am wicked. If you are not, then you have certainly have been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you've not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Of course, I have been rather reckless. <laughs> Glad to hear it. In fact, now that you mention the subject, I have been very bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be so proud of that, though I'm sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you are here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back until Monday afternoon. 
well, this is a great disappointment. I'm obliged to go off by the first train on Monday morning. I have a business appointment that I'm anxious to miss. <laughs> Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? The appointment is in London. Well, I know, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement if one wants to retain any sense of beauty of life. But still, I think you would better wait until Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wants to speak to you about your emigrating. About my what? You're emigrating. He's gone up to buy your outfit. I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties at all. I don't think you will require neckties. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Oh, well, the accounts I have received of Australia and the next world are not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? Oh, I'm afraid I'm not that. That is why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. I'm afraid I have no time this afternoon. Well, would you mind me reforming myself this afternoon? It's rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. You're looking a little worse. That is because I am hungry. Oh, how thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Thank you. Might I have a buttonhole first? I never have any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A Marichal Neal? No, I'd sooner have a pink rose. Why? Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. <laughs> I don't think it can be right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says things like that, such things to, to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. They are a snare that every sensible man would like to be caught in. Oh, I don't think I would care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. <laughs> you are too much alone, dear Dr. Chasuble. You should get married. A is a trope, I can understand. A woman trope, never. Oh, believe me. I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept, as well as the practice of the primitive church, was distinctly against matrimony. That is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. And you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. But is a man not equally attractive when married? No married man is ever attractive except to his wife. And often, I've been told, not even to her. Mm, that depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be depended on. Rightness can be trusted. Young women are green. <laughs> I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruit. <laughs> but where is Cecily? Perhaps she followed us to the school. Mr. Worthing. Mr. Worthing? This is indeed a surprise. We did not look for you till Monday afternoon. I have returned sooner than expected, Dr. Chaucer. I hope you are well. Dear Mr. Worthing, 
I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother! More shameful deaths and extravagance? Still leading his life of pleasure. Dead! Your brother Ernest, dead? Quite dead. What a lesson for him! I trust he will profit by it. Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolence. You have at least the consolation of knowing that you were always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernst! He had many faults, but it is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? Uh, no, <clears throat> he died abroad in Paris, in fact. I had a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Is the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. As a man sows, so shall he reap. Charity, dear Miss Prism, charity. None of us is perfect. I am, my myself, am peculiarly susceptible to drafts. Will the internment take place here? Uh, uh, no, uh, he seems to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. <clears throat> in Paris? I fear that hardly points to any very serious state of mind at the last. You would no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of the manor in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion joyful, or, as in this present case, distresses. Oh. <sighs> I have preached it at the harvest celebration, christenings, confirmations, on days of humiliation and festal days. The last time I delivered it in the cathedral as a charity sermon on behalf of the society for the prevention of discontent among the upper orders. The bishop, who was present, was much struck by some of the an analogies I drew. Ah, uh, uh, that reminds me, you mentioned christenings, I think, uh, Dr. Tossible. Uh, I suppose you know how to christen, all right. Uh, I mean, of course, you are continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I have often spoken to the poorer classes on this subject, but they don't seem to know what thrift is. But is there any particular infant in whom you are interested, Mr. Worthing? Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, uh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. Uh, but it is not for any child, dear doctor. I am very fond of uh, children. Uh, no, uh, the fact is, I would like to be christened myself this afternoon, if you have nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you have been christened already. I don't remember anything about it. Have you any grave doubts on the subject? Well, I certainly intend to have. Of course, I don't know if the thing would bother you in any way, or if you think I'm a little too old now. Not at all. The sprinkling, and indeed the immersion of adults, is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? You need have no apprehension. Sprinkling is all that is necessary, or indeed I think advisable. Our weather is so changeable. At what hour would you wish the ceremony performed? Oh, I might trot around about five, if that would suit you. <clears throat> perfectly, perfectly. In fact, I have two similar ceremonies to be performed at the same time. A case of twins that occurred recently in one of the outlying cottages on your own estate. Poor Jenkins the Carter, a most hard-working man. Go. Oh. I don't see much fun in being christened along with other babies. It would be childish. Uh, would half past five do? Admirably, admirably. And now, dear Mr. Worthing, I will not intrude any longer into a house of sorrow. I would merely beg you not to be too much bowed down by grief. 
what seems to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This seems to me a blessing of extremely obvious kind. Uncle Jack, oh, I'm pleased to see you back. But what horrid clothes you've got on. Do go and change them. Cecily! My child, my child. Oh, what is the matter, Uncle Jack? Do look happy. You look as if you had a toothache. And I've got such a surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother. Who? Your brother, Ernest. He arrived about half an hour ago. Uh, 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 what nonsense? I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that. However badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he's still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out. And you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful tidings. After we had all been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems to me peculiarly distressing. My brother is in the dining room. I, I, I don't know what it all means. I, I think this is perfectly absurd. Good heavens, man. Oh, Brother John, I've come down from town to tell you that I am very sorry for all the trouble I've given you and that I intend to lead a better life in the future. Uncle Jack, you're not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think his coming down here disgraceful and he knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, whom he goes to visit so often. And surely there must be much good in one who is kind to an invalid and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. Oh, he's been talking about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury? Well, I... Won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or about anything else. It's enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Well, of course, I admit that all the faults were on my side. But I must say that I think that Brother John's coldness to me is, well, peculiarly painful. I expected a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering it is the first time I have come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me. Never, never, never. Well, this is the last time I shall ever do it. Oh, it is pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation. I think that we might leave those two brothers together. Cicely, you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prism. My little task of reconciliation is over. Oh, you have done a beautiful action today, dear child. We must not be premature in our judgment. I feel very happy. You young scoundrel, Algy. You must get out of this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any bunburying here. Uh, I have put Mr. Ernest things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose that is all right. What? Uh, what? Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I have unpacked it and put it in the room next to yours. His luggage? Oh, oh yes, sir. Uh, a three portmanteaus, a dressing case, uh, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. Ah, Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Uh, Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Oh, yes, sir. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I have not been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. I haven't heard anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. <laughs> My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the smallest degree. Oh, I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk of Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. 
Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. Why don't you go up and change? It's perfectly childish to be in deep mourning for a man who's actually staying for a whole week with you in your house as a guest. I call it grotesque. You are certainly not staying with me for a whole week as a guest or anything else. You have got to leave. By the 4-5 train. I certainly won't leave you so long as you are in mourning. It would be most unfriendly. If I were in mourning, you would stay with me, I suppose. Well, I should think it very unkind of you if you didn't. Well, will you go if I change my clothes? Yes, if you're not too long. I never saw anybody take so long to dress and with such little result. Well, it's any rate, it's better than being always overdressed as you are. If I am occasionally a little overdressed, I make up for it by my being always immensely overeducated. Your vanity is ridiculous. Your conduct and outrage and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, you've got to catch the 4-5 and I hope you'll have a pleasant journey back to town. This bunburying, as you call it, has not been a success for you. I think it's been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily, and that is everything. I must see her before I go and make arrangements for another Burnberry. Oh, there she is. Oh, I merely came back to water the roses. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's gone to order the dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice drive? He's going to send me away. Then have we got to part? I'm afraid so. And it's a very painful parting. It is always painful to part from people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity, but even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just met is almost unbearable. Thank you. The dog cart is at the door, sir. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. I hope, Cecily, I shall not yes, offend yes. you. I hope, Cecily, that I shall not offend you if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it. May I? Oh, no. You see, it's simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and uh, consequently, meant for publication. <laughs> when it appears in volume form, I do hope you will order a copy. But pray, Ernest... Don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection, as you call it. You can go on. I'm quite ready for more. <clears throat> Don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. Cecily. Ever since I first looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Well, I don't think that you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily. <laughs> The dog cart is waiting, sir. Tell it to come around next week at the same hour. Yes, sir. Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying on till next week at the same hour. I don't care about Jack. I don't care about anybody in the whole world but you. I love you, Cecily. 
You will marry me, won't you? You silly boy, of course. Why? We've been engaged for the last three months. For the last three months? Yes, it will be exactly three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, have been the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And of course, a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him. After all, I dare say, with foolish of me, I fell in love with you, Ernest. Darling, and when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or the other. And after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. Next day I bought this little ring in your name, and this is the bangle with the true lover's knot I promised you to always wear. Did I give you this? It's very pretty, isn't it? Yes, you have wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given for you leading such a bad life. And this is the box in which I keep your dear letters. Uh, my letters? But my own sweet Cecilia, I've never written you any letters. It hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote always three times a week, and sometimes oftener. Oh, do let me read them, Cecily. Oh, couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited. The three you wrote me after I had broken off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. But was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of last March. You can see it in here in my entry if you like. Today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. Weather still continues charming. But why on earth did you break it off? What had I done? I had done nothing at all. Cecily, I'm very much hurt indeed to hear you broke it off, particularly when the weather was so charming. It would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once. I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. Oh, dear romantic boy. I, I hope your hair curls naturally, does it? Yes, darling, with a little help from others. Oh, I am so glad. We'll never break off our engagement again, Cecily. I don't think that I could break it off now that I've actually met you. Besides, of course, there's the question of your name. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> you must not laugh at me, darling. There's always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. There's something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. Pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. But, uh, my dear child, do uh, uh, you mean to say you could not love me if I had some other name? But what name? Oh, uh, any name you like. Uh, Algernon, for instance. I don't like the name of Algernon. My own dear, sweet, loving little darling, I, I really can't see why you should object to the name of Algernon. It is, after all, not a bad name. Um, in fact, it's rather an aristocratic name. Half the chaps in bankruptcy court are called Algernon. But seriously, Cecily, if I name were Algie, could you not love me? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character, but I fear that I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. 
Cecily, uh, your rector here, uh, uh, I suppose, has thoroughly experienced in the practices of all rites and ceremonies of the church? Oh, yes. Dr. Chasuble is a most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I must see him at once on a most important christening. Uh, uh, I mean, on most important business. Oh? I shan't be more than half an hour. Considering that we have been engaged since February the 14th, and that I have only met you today for the first time, I think it's rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period as half an hour. Can you make it uh, 20 minutes? No, I'll, I'll be back in no time. Oh, what an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. I must enter this proposal in my diary. A Miss Fairfax has just called to see Mr. Worthing. On very important business, Miss Fairfax states. Isn't Mr. Worthing in his library? Mr. Worthing went over in the direction of the rectory some time ago. Uh, pray ask the lady to come out here. Mr. Worthing is sure to be back soon, and you can bring tea. Uh, yes, Miss. Hmm. Miss Fairfax, I suppose one of the many good elderly women who are associated with Uncle Jack in some of his philanthropic work in London. I don't quite like women who are interested in philanthropic work. I think it is so forward of them. A Miss Fairfax. Pray, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew. What a very sweet name. Something tells me that we are going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we have known each other such a comfortably short time. Pray, sit down. I, I may call you Cecily, may I not? Oh, it's pleasure. Oh, and you shall always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Oh, well, then that's settled, isn't it? Oh, I hope so. Oh, perhaps this is, might be a favourable opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You have never heard of Papa, I suppose. I do think so. Outside the family circle, Papa, I am glad to say, is entirely unknown. And I think that is quite as it should be. The home seems to me to be the proper sphere for the man. Mm. And certainly, once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. It makes men so very attractive. Cecily, Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. Um, is it? It's part of a system, you see. So do you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolyn. I'm very fond of being looked at. <laughs> you are here on a short visit, I suppose. Oh, no. I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some other female relative of advanced years, resides here also. Oh, no. I have no mother. No, in fact, any relations. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes. I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh, it is strange that he had never mentioned to me that he had a ward. How secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. I'm not sure, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. 
I am very fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to state that now that I know that you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing you are a bit, well, just a little bit older than you seem to be and not quite so very alluring in appearance. In fact, I, if I may speak candidly. Oh, pray do. I think that whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. <laughs> well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish that you were fully 42 and more than usually plain for your age. Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He's the very soul of truth and honor. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. <laughs> but even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the influence of the physical charms of others. Modern, no less than ancient history, supplies us with many most painful examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, indeed, history would be most unreadable. I beg your pardon, Gwendolen. Did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother. His elder no, brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I'm sorry to say they have not been on good terms for a long time. <laughs> that accounts for it then. And now that I think of it, I have never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most men. Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was <laughs> growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if any cloud would come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian. Sure. <laughs> In fact, I am going to be his. I beg your pardon. Dearest Gwendolen, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married! <laughs> oh, my darling Cecily! I think there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the absolute latest. I am afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. Oh, well, it is certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, oh, pray do so. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read on the train. I am so sorry, dear Cecily, if uh, this is any disappointment to you, but I am afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolen, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he clearly has changed his mind. If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have got into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. <laughs> Do you allude to me, miscard you, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? 
How dare you? This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. Well, I am glad to say that I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. Ooh! Shall I lay the tea here as usual, Miss? Yes, as usual. Are there many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Oh yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills, quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that is why you live in town. Quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. Oh, so glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. <laughs> oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I cannot understand how anybody manages to exist in the country, if anybody who is anybody does. The country always bores me to death. Ah, this is what the newspapers call agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I've been told. <laughs> May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you, detestable girl, but I require tea. Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. Cake or bread and butter? Bread and butter, please. Cake is rarely seen in the best houses nowadays. <coughs> you have filled my tea with lumps of sugar, and though I ask most distinctly for bread and butter, you have given me cake. I am known for the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature, but I warn you, Miss Cardew, you may go too far. To save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl, there are no lengths to which I would not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I felt that you were false and deceitful. I am never so deceived in such matters. My first impressions of people are invariably right. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighborhood. Ernest! My own Ernest! Gwendolyn, darling! A moment. May I ask if you are engaged to be married to this young lady? To dear little Cecily? Of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I knew there must be some misunderstanding, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present round your waist is my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon? This is Uncle Jack. Jack? Oh. Here is Ernest. My own love. A moment, Ernest. May I ask you, are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Good heavens, Gwendolen! Yes, to good heavens, Gwendolen. I, I mean, to <laughs> Gwendolen. <laughs> of course not. What well, could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I felt sure there must be some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? Oh! Uh, are you called Algernon? I cannot deny it. Oh! And is your name really John? 
I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked. <laughs> but my name certainly is John. It has been John for years. Oh, a gross deception has been practiced on both of us. My poor wounded Cecily. My sweet wronged Gwendolyn. You will call me sister, will you not? There is just one question I would like to be allowed to ask my guardian. An admirable idea. Mr. Worthing, there is just one question I would like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, so it is a matter of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, Cecily, it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. It is the first time in my life that I have ever been reduced to such a painful position, and I am really quite inexperienced in doing anything of the kind. However, I will tell you quite frankly that I have no brother, Ernest. I have no brother at all. I have never had a brother in my life, and I certainly have not the smallest intention of ever having one in the future. No brother at all? <laughs> None. Had you never a brother of any kind? Never. Not of any kind. I am afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. It's not a very pleasant position for a young girl to suddenly find herself in now, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to come after us there. No. Men are so cowardly, aren't they? This ghastly state of things is what you call bunburying, I suppose. Yes, and a perfectly wonderful bunbury it is. The most wonderful bunbury I've ever had in my life. <laughs> well, you've no right whatsoever to bunbury here. That is absurd. One has a right to bunbury anywhere one chooses. Every serious bunburyist knows that. Serious bunburyist? Oh, good heavens. Well, one must be serious about something if one wants to have any amusement in life. I happen to be serious about bunburying. What on earth you are serious about? I haven't got the remotest idea. About everything, I should fancy. You have such an absolutely trivial nature. Well, the only small satisfaction I have in the whole of this wretched business is that your friend Bunbury is quite exploded. <laughs> you won't be able to run down to the country quite as often as you used to, dear Algy, and a very good thing too. Your brother is a little off color, isn't he, dear Jack? You won't be able to disappear to London quite so frequently as your wicked custom was. And not a bad thing either. As for your conduct toward Miss Cardew, I must say that your taking in a sweet, simple, innocent girl like that is quite inexcusable, to say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. I can see no possible defense at all for your deceiving a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax. To say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn, that's all. I love her. Well, I simply wanted to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. Now, that is certainly no chance of your marrying Miss Cardew. I don't think there is much likelihood, Jack, of you and Miss Fairfax being united. Well, that is no business of yours. If it was my business, I wouldn't talk about it. It's very vulgar to talk about one's business. Only people like stockbrokers do that, and then merely at dinner parties. <laughs> How can you sit there, calmly eating muffins, when we are in this 
horrible trouble I, I can't make out. You seem to me to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. The butter would probably get on my cuffs. One should always eat muffins quite calmly. It is the only way to eat them. I say, it's perfectly heartless. You're eating muffins at all under the circumstances. When I am in trouble, eating is the only thing that consoles me. Indeed, when I am in really great trouble, as anyone who knows me intimately will tell you, I refuse everything except food and drink. At the present moment, I am eating muffins because I am unhappy. Besides, I'm particularly fond of muffins. Oh, well, that is no reason why you should eat them all in that greedy way. I wish you would have tea cake instead. I don't like tea cake. Good heavens. I suppose a man may eat his own muffins in his own garden. But you have just said it was perfectly heartless to eat muffins. I said it was perfectly heartless of you under the circumstances. That is a very different thing. That may be, but the muffins are the same. Oh, mm -hmm. I wish to goodness you would go. You can't possibly ask me to go without having some dinner. It's absurd. I never go without my dinner. No one ever does, except vegetarians and people like that. Besides, I've just made arrangements with Dr. Charzable to be christened at a quarter to six under the name of Ernest. My dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I made arrangements this morning with Dr. Charzable to be christened myself at 5.30. And I naturally will take the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. We cannot both be christened Ernest. It's absurd. Besides, I have a perfect right to be christened if I like. There is no evidence at all that I have ever been christened by anybody. I should think it extremely probable I never was. And so does Dr. Chasuble. It is entirely different in your case. You have been christened already. Yes, but I have not been christened for years. Yes, but you have been christened. That is the important thing. Quite so. So I know my constitution can stand it. If you are not quite sure about your ever having been christened, I must say I think it rather dangerous you're venturing on it now. It might make you very unwell. You can hardly have forgotten that someone very closely connected with you was very nearly carried off this week in Paris by a severe chill. Yes, but you said yourself that a severe chill is not hereditary. It usn't be, I know. But I dare say it is now. Oh. Science is always coming up with wonderful improvements in things. That's nonsense. You are always talking nonsense. Jack, you are at the muffins again. Mm. I wish you wouldn't. There are only two left. I told you I was particularly fond of muffins. But I hate tea cake. Why on earth, then, do you allow tea cake to be served up to your guests? What ideas you have of hospitality. Algernon, I told you to go. I don't want you here. Why don't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea yet. And there is still one muffin left. No. <sighs> they did not follow us at once into the house as anyone else would have done seems to me to show that they have some sense of shame left. They have been eating muffins. That looks like repentance. They don't seem to notice us at all. 
Couldn't you cough? But I haven't got a cough. Oh, they're looking at us. What a frontry. They're approaching. That's very forward of them. Let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly. It's the only thing to do now. Three, three little maids from school. Three little maids from school. This dignified silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. Uh, Mr. Worthing, I have something very particular to ask you. Much depends on your reply. Gwendolen, your common sense is invaluable. <sighs> Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order to have the opportunity of meeting you. <laughs> that certainly seems a satisfactory explanation, does it not? Yes, dear, if you can believe him. I don't, but that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. Oh, true. In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you offer to me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have an opportunity of coming to town to see me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? Oh, I have the greatest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. This is not the moment for German skepticism. Their explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing's. <laughs> that seems to me to have a stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires one with absolute credulity. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes, uh, I mean, no. Oh, true, I had forgotten. There are principles at stake here that one cannot surrender. Which one of us should tell them? The task is not a pleasant one. Could we not both speak at the same time? Oh, an excellent idea. I almost always speak at the same time as other people. Will you take the time from me? Certainly. Hmm. <clears throat> Your Christian names are still an inseparable barrier. That is all. Our Christian names? Is that all? But we are going to be christened this afternoon. For my sake, you are prepared to do this terrible thing? I am. Please me, you are ready to face this fearful ordeal? I am. How absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. Where questions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. We are. They have moments of physical courage of which we women know absolutely nothing. Oh, darling. <clears throat> Lady Bracknell. Good heavens! Gwendolen. What does this mean? Mean that I'm engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Come here. Sit down. Sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind of a sign of mental decay in young and of physical weakness in the old. A prize, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin. I followed her at once by a luggage train. Her unhappy father is, I am glad to say, under the impression that she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture by the University Extension Scheme on the influence of permanent income and thought. I do not propose to undeceive him. Indeed, I have never undeceived him on any question. I would consider it wrong. But of course, you will clearly understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment. On this point, as indeed on all points, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind, sir. And now, as regards Algernon. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta? 
May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Uh, oh, uh, no, no. Bunbury doesn't live here. Uh, Bunbury is uh, somewhere else at present. In fact, Bunbury is dead. Dead? When did Mr. Bunbury die? His death must have been extremely sudden. No, oh, I killed Bunbury this afternoon. I mean, poor Bunbury died this afternoon. What did he die of? Bunbury? Oh, he was quite exploded. Exploded? Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware that Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished for his morbidity. My dear Aunt Augusta, I mean he was found out. The doctors found out that Bunbury could not live, that is what I mean. So, Bunbury died. Oh, he seems to have had great confidence in the opinion of his physicians. I am glad, however, that he made up his mind at the last to some definite course of action and acted under proper medical advice. And now that we have finally got rid of this Mr. Bunbury, may I ask, Mr. Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is now holding in what seems to me a peculiarly unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. I am engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon? Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. I do not know whether there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air of this part of Hertfordshire, but the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably above the proper average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. I think some preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. Mr Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected to any of the larger railway stations in London. Uh, I merely desire information. Until yesterday, I had no idea there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, S.W., Jovese Park, Surrey, Dorking, and the Sporan, Furfshire, N.B. That sounds not unsatisfactory. Three addresses always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. But what proof have I of their authenticity? I have carefully preserved the court guides of the period. They are open to your inspection, Lady Bracknell. I have known strange errors in that publication. Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Messrs. Markby, Markby, and Markby. Ah, oh, Markby, Markby, and Markby. A firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am told that one of the Mr. Markbys is occasionally to be seen at dinner parties. So far, I am satisfied. <laughs> How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. Oh, I also have in my possession, you will, be, you will be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation, and the measles, the English and the German variety. Ah, oh, a life crowded with incident, I see, though perhaps somewhat too exciting for a young girl. I am not myself in favour of premature experiences. Gwendolen, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. As a matter of form, Mr Worthing, I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, about £130,000 in the funds. That is all. Goodbye, Lady Bracknell. So pleased to have seen you. A moment, Mr. Worthing. A hundred and thirty thousand pounds? And in the funds? 
Miss Cardew seems to me to be a most attractive young lady now that I look at her. Few girls of the present day have any really solid qualities, any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Come, come over here, dear. Pretty child, your dress is sadly simple and your hair seems almost as nature might have left it. But we can soon alter all that. Poorly experienced French maid produces a, a really marvelous result in a very brief space of time. I remember recommending one to young Lady Lansing. And after three months, her own husband did not know her. And after six months, nobody knew her. <laughs> Kindly turn around, sweet child. Uh, no, the side view is what I want. Yes, quite as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points in our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. The chin a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on the way the chin is worn. They are worn very high just at present. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distant social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest dearest, prettiest girl in the whole world, and I don't care tuppence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can get into it do that. Dear child, of course, you know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to depend upon, but I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. Uh, well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily, you may kiss me. Thank you. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. To speak frankly, I am not in favor of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage which I think is never advisable. <clears throat> I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until he comes of age. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, I may almost say, an ostentatiously illegible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one desire? Oh, it pains me very much to have to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew. But the fact is that I do not approve of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful untruthful my nephew algernon impossible he is an oxonian oh i fear that there can be no possible doubt about the matter uh, this afternoon during my temporary absence in london on an important question of romance he obtained admission to my house by means of, of the false pretense of being my brother under an assumed name, he drank, I've just been informed by my butler, an entire pint bottle of my Perrier Jouet Brou 89, wine I was especially reserving for myself. 
continuing his disgraceful deception, he succeeded in the course of out in the afternoon in alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stayed to tea and devoured every <coughs> single muffin. And what makes his conduct all the more heartless is that he was perfectly well aware from the first that I have no brother, that I have never had a brother, and that I don't intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so myself yesterday afternoon. Hey, and Mr. Worthing, after careful consideration, I have decided entirely to overlook my nephew's conduct to you. Oh, that is very generous of you, Lady Brackle. Uh, my own decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come here, sweet child. How old are you, dear? Well, I'm really only 18, but I must admit to 21, or 20, when I go to evening parties. You're perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. 18, but admitting to 20 at evening parties. Well, it will not be very long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So, I, I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Excuse me, Lady Blacknell, for interrupting you again, but it only fair that, uh, to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew is not come age legally until she is 35. Oh, that does not seem to me to be a, a grave objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have, of their own free choice, uh, remained 35 for years. Lady Dumbleton is an instance in point. To my knowledge, she has been 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which was many years ago now. I see no reason why our dear Cecily should be even still more attractive at the age mentioned than she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Algy, could you wait for me till I was 35? Of course I could, Cecily, you know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait all that time. I hate watching even f waiting even five minutes for anybody. It always makes me rather cross. I'm not a punctual person myself, I know, but I do like punctuality in others and waiting even to be married is quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr. Moncrief. My dear Mr. Wedding, as Miss Cardew states positively that she cannot wait until she is 35, a remark which I'm bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat impatient nature. I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. Oh, but dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. The moment that you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. That is a destiny. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. Well, then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. That's not the destiny that I propose for Gwendolyn. Elginor, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear, we must have already missed five, if not six trains. To miss any more would expose us to comment on the platform. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christenings? Sir, is not that somewhat premature? Uh, both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age, the idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptized. I will not hear of such successes. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he learned that that was the way in which you wasted your time and money. Am I to understand then that there are 
ought to be no christenings at all this afternoon? I don't think that the things are now. It would be much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chasuble. I am grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. They savor of the heretical views of the Anabaptists, views that I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. However, as, as your present mood seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will return to the church at once. Indeed, I must have, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention her Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I am on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent nature, remotely connected to education? She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I am celibate, madame. I am a bit... Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been the, the least three years Miss Curdew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. Um, she approaches. She, she is nigh. I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Canon. I've been waiting for you for an hour and three quarters. Prism, come here, Prism. Prism, where is that baby? 28 years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104 Upper Grosvenor Street, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than usually revolting sentimentality. But the baby was not there. Prism, where is that baby? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish that I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared as usual to take the baby out in the preambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction for which I can never forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and placed the baby in the handbag. But where did you deposit the handbag? Do not ask me, Mr. Worthing. Miss Prism, this is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposit the handbag that contained that infant. I left it in the cloakroom of one of the larger railway stations in London. What railway station? Victoria, the Brighton line. I must retire to my room for a moment. Gwendolyn, wait here for me. If you are not too long, I will wait here for you all my life. What do you think this means, Lady Bracknell? I dare not even suspect, Dr. Chasuble. I need hardly tell you that in families of high position, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. They are hardly considered the thing. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. I think he was having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They are always vulgar and often convincing. Oh, 
It has stopped now. Oh. I wish he would come to some conclusion. This suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. Is this the handbag, Miss Prism? Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. Well, it seems to be mine. Yes, here is an injury. Uh, it, it received through the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger and um, happier days. Okay. Here is the stain on the lining, right here, caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, uh, an incident that occurred at Leamington, and here on the lock um, are my initials. I had forgotten that in, in an extravagant mood, I had had them placed there. Um, the bag is undoubtedly mine. Undoubtedly. And I am delighted to have it so unexpectedly restored to me. It's been a great inconvenience being without it all these years. Miss Prism, more is restored to you than this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes. Mother! Oh, Mr. Worthing, I am oh. unmarried. Unmarried? I, I do not deny that is a serious blow. But after all, who has the right to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another for women? Mother, I forgive you! Mr. Worthing! Oh. There is some error! There is the lady who could tell you who you really are. Lady Bracknell? Well, I hate to seem inquisitive, but would you kindly inform me who I am? I am afraid that the news that I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. Algy's elder brother? Then I have a brother after all? I knew I had a brother. I always said I had a brother. <laughs> Cecily, how could you ever have doubted that I have a brother? Dr. Chasuble, my unfortunate brother. <laughs> Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. <laughs> Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. Algy, you young scoundrel, you will have to treat me with more respect in the future. You have never behaved to me like a brother in all your life. Well, not till today, old boy, I admit. I did my best, however, although I was out of practice. My own. But what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you have become someone else? Oh, good heavens! I had quite forgotten that point. Your decision on the subject of my name is irrevocable, I suppose. I never change except in my affections. <laughs> oh, what a noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. Then the question had better be cleared up at once. A Aunt Augusta, a moment. At the time when Miss Prism left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. Then I was christened. That is settled. Now, what name was I given? Let me know the worst. Being the oldest son, you would have naturally christened after your father. Yes, but what was my father's name? I cannot at the present moment recall what the general's Christian name was, but I have no doubt he had one. He was eccentric, I admit, but only in later years, and that was the result of the Indian climate marriage and indigestion and other things of that kind. Algy, can't you recollect what our father's Christian name was? My dear boy, we were never even on speaking terms. He died before I was a year old. His name would appear on the army lists of the period, I suppose. Aunt Augusta? The general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life, but I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. Oh, 
the army lists of the last 40 years are here. These delightful records should have been my constant study. No. Oh. Oh. M generals, uh, Malum, uh, Moxbaum, Magley, oh, what ghastly names they have. Um, Markby, Migsby, Mobs, uh, Moncrief, Lieutenant, 1840, Captain, Lieutenant, Colonel, Colonel, General, 1869, a oh, Christian names here. Yeah. Ernest, John, oh. I always told you, Gwendolyn, my name was Ernest, didn't I? Well, it is Ernest. After all, I, I mean, it naturally is Ernest. Yes, I remember now that the general was called Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason for disliking that name. Ernest, my own Ernest. I felt from the first that you could have no other name. Gwendolyn, it is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all his life he has been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you forgive me? I can, for I feel that you are sure to change. My own one. Letitia. Frederick, at last. Cecily, at last. Gwendolyn, at last. My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I have now realized for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. 